a very pleasant morning uh, to all the attendees respected faculty members uh, dear research scholars and students who have joined us again today after two days of extremely insightful lectures by resource persons of great repute uh, for which we have received immensely positive feedback it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to day 3 of the 3 day lecture series on literature and literary studies organized by the department of english and other foreign languages srm institute of science and technology ramapuram campus chennai today we are broadcasting a live webinar on post colonial aura in the australian and canadian literary milieu and we have with us today dr samuel roof is associate professor of english madras christian college chennai a resource person who is well known for his insightful lectures and who is going to deliver what we are sure is another enlightening lecture uh, today so please stay tuned uh, before we move on to the welcome address as usual i would like to remind all the attendees who have joined us to stay with us till the end of the session uh, and please don't forget to post your queries if any uh, in the live chat stream on youtube during the q and a session at the end of the presentation I would now like to call upon Dr. Rama, Professor and Head, Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Walter. Good morning, friends. I welcome every one of you to the third day of the three-day online lecture series organized by the Department of English and Foreign Languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram Campus. After two very enriching lectures on the previous two days we are into the grand finale today we have amidst us a very experienced and seasoned academician Dr Samuel Rufus associate professor of english madras christian college uh, to deliberate on the topic the post colonial aura in the australian and canadian milieu with no specific definition the word post colonialism always intrigues us but it gives us enormous scope for research australian and canadian literature no doubt are rich in texts dealing with post colonial studies canada formed by the interactions of three distinct cultures aboriginal french and english and australia colonized by the british empire has pro have produced uh, in fact rich literary texts and writers like uh, Margaret Atwood of uh, Canada and Patrick White of Australia. However, friends, our guest speaker, Dr. Samuel Rufus, will throw intellectual light on this topic today, and I'm sure each one of you will cherish and carry back with you the memories of these three days. The Department of English and other foreign languages is greatly indebted to Dr. Rufus for his kind consent to be amid us today. I extend a very warm and hearty welcome to you sir and I thank you heartily for joining us. At this juncture I hand over the session to Nadia Michaeli for the introductory remarks. Thank you ma'am. Happy morning to all the participants. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more you are a leader by john quincy adams one such great leader is here with us today i am happy to introduce today's guest speaker dr s samuel rufus associate of english madras christian college chennai he started his career as lecturer at the american college madurai and later joined madras christian college as assistant professor in the year 2003 his academic achievements are many but to mention a few he is the winner of the president vengitraman gold medal for excellent academic excellence and also the winner of the tamil nadu government merit scholarship for excellence in academics from bharathidasan university in 2001 he has acted as resource person for more than 20 programs and also published many papers in various national and international conferences he has organized more than 15 programs with eminent professors and all acted as external examiner for ma and mphil dissertation in various colleges 
Dr. Rufus authored many books and also edited various books and journals and has been the member of doctoral committee in various universities. It is an honor and privilege to have you with us today, sir. And we are fortunate to have such an eminent person to deliver a talk on postcolonial era in the Australian and Canadian literary milieu. With this note, I request sir to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the warm introduction. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, head of the department. And thank you, um, SRM, for having invited me to the finale, the grand finale of this wonderful webinar series. And uh, my uh, topic is very broad in its approach. I'll just give you, like, you know, when you try a new dish, uh, what the, the waiter will tell you is, no, this dish is like this, you know, it tastes like this. You haven't tried it out, sir, but this is how you have to approach it. You'll have to approach it with a fork. You'll have to approach it with a spoon, or you, you can have it straight with your hands, you know. Like how you approach a new food, a new menu, the same way, I'll just give you approaches on how to approach texts with the history of colonialism, especially with relation to the Australian and the Canadian literary milieu. Because the word post-colonialism, this will be a kind of a primer, because I infer that the mo most of the audience here or the participants here today are PG students, UG students, right, and research scholars and teachers also who will be interested in post colonial studies. So this will be a primer in the short one hour duration that I have. I'll just give you a primer on how to approach like texts uh, in this, this broad, wonderful field of post-colonial studies. Why the term post-colonial? And then how you apply you know, post-colonial criticism and theory to the text. Very simple, I'll just give you, I'm just introducing a new menu a new dish and i'm also telling you how to approach that dish how to take it inside how to swallow it how to digest it right so you can uh, if you're students right who are interested in post-colonial studies you can have a pen and paper with you uh, you can maybe you can make a note of the points and towards the end you can ask me questions so uh, just imagine this room as i tell my students pg students just imagine this room I own this room, I rule this room, I have been Raja or Rani of this room for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Suddenly one fine day, somebody, you call them white, from the West, tries to conquer my land using force, using arms, using enticements, and then what they do is they try to push me away from my place. What happens is the word I would use is the word displacement. I'm displaced from my own native milieu. And what happens as a result? When I'm displaced, another person comes into my room. I was the Raja or the Rani of this wonderful room that I had cherished. My forefathers had given me a beautiful legacy over a period of time. And today, Somebody, maybe the whites, they come to my room, ask me to go out and then indoctrinate me. How? Through various strategies, a lot of strategies, they have to indoctrinate me. And these strategies, they influence me, they inspire me, and they impact me. Three words, influence me. They sometimes inspire me and they greatly have an impact on me. So, pre colonial period, when I was the Raja or the Rani of my own land, now the colonizer has come into my land, colonial period, and now after the colonizer has left my land, this again comes back to me. These are the three phases of post colonial studies. My land once again comes back to me, but am I the same? Or is there a difference in the way I speak, in the way I behave, in the way I engage with my own people? What has happened? Is their impact, their influence, their inspiration positive? Negative. 
beneficent or maleficent, good or bad? These are some of the questions that we ask when we approach such texts from Australia, from Canada, from India, a whole lot of post-colonial nation states. Please remember, these nation states with a history of colonialism alone, if you watch, they will have English as a second language. You know, English has three levels. One is called English as a foreign language. Japan or China or Russia or South Korea or North Korea, these nations have English as a foreign language, EFL. Then some countries, English is a native language, ENL, like England like America, like Canada, like uh, New Zealand, you know, they, it's a native language for them. And then there are other countries where English is a second language. So I've said three. One is English as a foreign language. They don't want to do anything with English, like Japan, South Korea, China, North Korea, you know, or, or, or all these nation states, all these nations. And other countries, where English is the native tongue, like America or England. And the third one is English as a second language. Wherever you find English as a second language, most of these nations had a history of Englishmen and women coming to this place. That's why English is a second language. Let's remember this. So because they came here, they, they conquered me. First thing they did was, they gave the language to me. Please remember, language is a very important tool in postcolonial studies. In page 19 of the wonderful book, Beginning Postcolonialism, John McLeod, you must read this book if you're interested in pursuing you know, further research in postcolonial studies. John McLeod, in page 19, to the left of the book, towards the bottom, he says, you know, language forms the intersection where power and knowledge meet. So language is very important. Now you'll ask me a very simple question. Sir, language helps us. Language is, you know, we call it mother tongue. Why do you talk bad about language? You know, I'm not talking about a mother tongue, the vernacular. The language that was used by the white to dominate us. So how can you say language can dominate me? Yes. Tiongo, you know, uh, I, 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 a post-colonial scholar, he says, language carries culture. He's a great post-colonial critic. He says, language carries culture. Just imagine if language carries culture, the language that I speak carries a culture with it. If I speak, you know, even in Kerala, there are types and types of Malayalam. In Trivandrum, there is a Malayalam, right? In the in, in, in Kodikur, there is a Malayalam. Like in Tamil Nadu, you have Tinnalveli, there is a Malayalam. The, uh, Tamil. Right, Madurai Tamil is different, and Chennai Tamil is completely different. Like that, you know, the language that I speak reflects me. The language carries culture. When I speak the English language, I automatically try to acclimatize with the language of the colonizer. Have you seen this, you know, in local trains? I have seen this, right? In 2003, when I joined this college here in Chennai, as a teacher, I used to go by the you know, local trains. When you step into the compartment, these little boys, young boys, college boys will be talking in their local vernacular, like uh, Tamil or Malayalam or Telugu. But the moment the opposite gender comes in, immediately they'll switch codes. They'll start talking in English, right? Hi, how are you? Hi, buddy, how are you doing? I talking, you talking, why are you talking? No, all these, you know, although they might not have been familiar with English, they feel that speaking English elevates them. This mentality. The whites knew that language was a strategy to colonize. In Mulkra Janan's Kuli, you have a boy who tries to speak like the English, tries to wear a white hat, white man's hat, white man's coat, white man's walking stick, white man's tobacco. Why? Because he thinks that it has a lot of you know, weightage or prestige to it. And so he has imbibed the Englishman's not only language, but also culture. That's why Thiongo says in his wonderful article in his text called Decolonizing the Mind. 
he says we should decolonize the mind more than decolonizing the land the land has been decolonized but we should decolonize the mind because the mind has been colonized by a language the white man's language which has inspired me impacted me influenced me the way i think you ask any person you no know, randomly which is your favorite movie they'll say some western movie which is your favorite book my favorite novel some western book will be there some western novel will be there why because they feel you know that is prestige any who's your favorite musician or singer they say justin bieber or uh, you know uh, madonna or britney spears ask them about you know local singers or local musicians oh okay okay but still you know nothing like that so these ways of seeing or internalizing this is the term they use i have internalized the language of the colonizer and what happens something negative happens i look down upon my own people when the, the, somebody doesn't talk in good english we say you know paun this fellow doesn't know how to survive just imagine you evaluate a person based on how they speak english how stupid it could be we are english teachers but still i'm talking post colonial studies from my heart when i say this can you evaluate a person based on the way they speak english when english is a second language to them not even a mother tongue or a vernacular for them can you do this atrocity when a person speaks bad english or not so fluent english indirectly we condemn them saying oh this guy doesn't know the standards david dabidi in a caribbean writer he he has written a lot of poems like valerie bloom all in creole you can't read one line of it you know what he says there there is a little boy who speaks in bbc english this senior dabidi is very angry with this little boy see how he wants to talk bbc english remember when we were kids also in those days they used to say what bbc for the accent what bbc for the right pronunciation so this little boy has completely forgotten his roots he is speaking in bbc english he attacks him how dare you you know and he looks down upon his own people because they can't speak in english what uh, tiango gogi what tiango says in decolonizing the mind i was taught to look down upon my own people because they could not speak in english how bad when you look down upon your own people because they cannot speak english they lose their aura they lose their essence they lose their individuality they lose their identity so who determines your identity a westerner has already determined your identity and you are now an object you and i are objects because our identity has already been determined by somebody else and this is what post colonial studies discusses or interrogates how can you represent me how can you determine my identity for me how can you say that speaking english makes me cultured so when you approach these texts you should always note the language that is used in these texts edward cow brathwaite another famous post colonial writer caribbean writer he says the hurricane does not roar in pentameters the pentameter by the way is the you know metrical form for the westerners any you know poem from england would be in, in in pentameters so he says we are natives we are caribbeans caribs we don't roar in pentameter we have our own style don't expect us to succumb to a western style so now quickly now after they left us who the whites left us there were three distinct periods of decolonization that happened one is the loss of america 1776 then the loss of what is called right their colonies a whole lot of colonies we can call them settler nations four settler nations please remember them one settler nations means what whites found these places good the environment was good for them so the whites went and settled there in india is not called a settler nation because 
they did not find the climate here favorable maybe we don't know but in four nations they settled and even today whites are the majority there what are these four nations one is canada one is australia one is new zealand and one is south africa please uh, don't forget these four lands these nations because we'll be discussing two now right canada australia new zealand and south africa they are called settler states or settler nation states because they dispossessed me from my land and they came in and uh, they started ruling over me hegemony this is called displacement who is displaced i am here for not hundreds of years thousands of years cherishing my own land but now i am displaced from where from my own land by who by the whites these are called settler states settler nation states canada australia new zealand and south africa and once you are displaced what happens to you how do you react to that there are two options when you are displaced from your own place there are two options isn't it just imagine i am thrown out of my house right by some foreigner who comes and settles here what do i do i have two options one is i fight back isn't it i can fight back i can resist or i can escape i will escape fight or flight two terms either of these you can do you can fight or flight flight means escape avoid them i don't want them the aborigines in australia were displaced they were there for thousands of years they were displaced the first nations the metis in canada they were displaced when the whites came in the maoris in new zealand were displaced when the whites came in like this in south africa the black natives were displaced when the whites came in and what happened they could not speak for themselves who spoke for them please remember there are two terms one is i present myself my voice my worries my pain my difficulties from my own voice that's different isn't it but someone represents me they displace me and what happens is they say this guy he has been a native here for thousands of years but they don't know civilization they are stupid people they are ignorant people they are unwise savage uncultured uncouth how dare no they don't know anything about me but they represent me this is what spivak says the politics of representation how dare you represent me you cannot speak for me so when you are displaced three things can happen for you when you are displaced from your own home three things can happen for you the white comes here he becomes the rani or the raja and what they do they give you three terms they make you silenced you are silenced forever right three terms please remember this i always repeat this because these are three normatives for post colonial studies they silence you you cannot speak no they control the press they control the media they control power right you cannot speak at all because you know they'll be in all positions of power the whites so you are silenced not only silenced you are stigmatized you know what is stigma dehumanizing a person you don't consider that person as a human being at all you consider that person as a gorilla or a ape in one of uh, uh, ad hopes poems right the chatter of cultured apes he calls you know australians the, you know cultured apes you can't speak for yourself because you are stigmatized or dehumanized the third one you are stereotyped stereotype means what you are not something but you are made to show as if you are something you are not bad but you are stereotyped as bad over a period of time if i say i am just giving you an example right over a period of time if i say this tree 
although it is a native tree it is a wonderful tree right although it is a you know beautiful tree for me over a period of time the white settler comes in and says this is a very dangerous tree this has a lot of ill luck this tree will erode all the local plants over a period of time they say the same thing again and again and again what happens it becomes the truth although for me my ancestors my forefathers this tree was worshiped but now the westerner comes and says no this tree is poisonous and what happens is right everyone believes that and after that i am stereotyped as poisonous so three things happen when you are displaced so what does you know post colonial studies do in general i'll just give you five terms you can make a note of that fight what does post colonial studies do i said fight or flight fight means fighting right the fighting spirit fighting has a lot of you know strategies one is you can literally fight them if you think you can't literally fight them you can do something else they say you know the pen is mightier than the sword that means you can write there are people who were touched who were pained in their hearts who couldn't express themselves you know what they did they couldn't protest in the streets they used their pen and started writing whatever came to their mind they started writing the pen becomes mightier than the sword today we read a lot of these aboriginal writers thanks to them because they used their pen if they hadn't recorded their pains holocaust survivors their diaries if they hadn't recorded that you and i wouldn't have known the the problems of the aborigines or the first nations anita hayes an aboriginal writer she was in india last year on uh, 22nd january and 30th january i attended a lecture she was in queen mary's college dr preeti srinivasan uh, hosted her we were there she was saying a lot of things like growing up aboriginal you know uh, it uh, growing up aboriginal right it's it's a type of a book that she has written the pain of being an aborigine in australia she says how she was stigmatized silenced right and how she was marginalized a whole lot of negative terms were given to her she says and she also says i don't want to write about the butterfly how long will you write about the butterflies i don't want i'm just paraphrasing her i don't want to use a lot of adjectives for butterflies please remember in post colonial poem or a post colonial text you will not find happiness you will not find a celebration like you find in daffodils or the road not taken there is pain in every word and every line that they write in any post colonial poem that you read a majority of them you will find there is an angst or a pain deep within every word or every line that comes from the pen why because they have been stereotyped stigmatized and silenced by who by somebody else who has come to my land and displaced me this pain is evidenced is reflected in their writing and that's why you know anita hai says when she i don't want to write about the butterfly i will write about the pain that i underwent another post colonial writer chinu achb says no unless the lions have their own historians the lion should have their own historians otherwise the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter so this is a very you know crisis situation derek walcott says i met history but history does not recognize me why because my thoughts have not been recorded that is why we say to our students record your thoughts write down your thoughts if it is the pandemic period if it is an atrocity that happens in your you know in your society like a dowry death sudha murthy is one social feminist who writes like that you see a dowry death you and you see an etc you see a woman being harassed write about that when you put pen to paper it becomes a document and that is why you know these writers are celebrated even today because they wrote 
their thoughts. Five strategies I'll quickly say, right? After the colonial masters, they left us. After the colonizers, they left my land. You know, how do I approach, right? This broad, wonderful field of post-colonial studies. Five strategies I'll quickly say, five short lines. Maybe if you have a pen, you can write down. The first one is, right? Studying new forms of imperialism. The colonizers have left us, but are there new forms of imperialism? You know, what we call coca colonization. When I go to a shop, what is my favorite drink that I order? Is it Coca-Cola or is it Pepsi or is it Domino's Pizza or is it KFC? I'm not debunking any, any brand or anybody here. I'm just saying how our mind is stereotyped. When I go to a shop, do I ask for a toothpaste or do I ask for Colgate salt? That means my mind is colonized. When I have a Coca-Cola with me, if I take a photograph and put it up on the net, meaning it will give me a prestige, my mind has been colonized. If I you know, have a pizza, a Domino's or whatever pizza, right, and then I'm so proud of it, I take a photograph of it and post it on my walls on you know, social networking sites, my mind still has the colonial hangover. If I feel shy to talk in my native tongue, Malayalam or Telugu or Tamil or Hindi, I speak in English all the time. Even though there is not a need, the colonial hangover is there. So new forms of imperialism, like a colonization, do we still respect them, regard them in high esteem, or do we treat them as equals? Second, new forms of resistance in language, in the poetry that I write, in novels that I write. How, what are the new forms of resistance? And new forms of identities for me. Am I a hybrid? You know, uh, Homi Baba uses these terms, hybrid, mi hybridity, mimicry, ambivalence, a whole lot of terms. What is my identity? Just imagine, you know, an Indian girl settled in the United States. That is the story, you know, a an Indian girl settled in the United States, a little girl. An American white boy comes up to her and asks her, who are you? She doesn't know how to reply. Then he asks, who are you? Tell me, are you an Indian? Are you an American? Do you belong here? Then he bullies her. Then he pushes her. And he asks, tell me, who are you? Now, she can't say she's an American because, you know, her origins, her roots are in India. She can't say, I'm an Indian because, you know, she's born, brought up, settled in America. This is the ambivalent predicament, my identity, emerging identities. That is the third point. New forms of imperialism, new forms of resistance, emerging identities that represent me or that ping me, you know, a pigeonhole me into this such a such a person. Because, you know, identity is connected with, we all know, three things, right? Identity is connected with language and with culture. So please remember these three terms, they go together. Language, identity, and culture. And, uh, you know, fourth one, uh, I said resistance also, right? How do I resist? What are the strategies of resistance that I use, uh, you know, in society? Or, you know, and the fourth one is, can I go back to that past, the good old past, when I was the Rani or the Raja of my own land? Can I have an aggressive return to my past? Is it possible? Or is it needed? Is it feasible? And the last one, the traces left in these nation states because of a colonial education. Please remember, we all have been indoctrinated by a colonial education. That's why you and I talk in English like this. We talk in English much better than the Japanese or the South Koreans. In, in Madras Christian College, where I teach, you know, we have a huge number of South Koreans coming every year just to be trained in spoken English. I, I was one of the teachers. They have a special air-conditioned room where we give them 
coaching and training for you know training them in spoken english they find it very difficult to speak even one sentence in english properly every year we do that and i am told that they even cut the tip of their tongues that's an operation that they do if if you know to be familiar with english to speak english fluently we are much much better than them that is because of the colonial hangover that we have the traces of colonial education that have been handed down to us how it has impacted us i am going into only one aspect with the aspect of language the traces traces means right the footprints of our colonial education how has it impacted or influenced me how does it affect my ways of seeing the other day someone asked me a very interesting question a very pertinent question is post colonial studies relevant today sir we are more post colonial how why do we want to go back to colonialism uh, colonization again and again i said yes and no it is relevant if you feel that you are looking down on your own people if you feel shy if you feel embarrassed to speak in your own native tongue in front of people if you want to swap to english that means you still are in the hangover when you see a tamil book or a malayalam book or a hindi book or a telugu book you keep it away no 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 if i have this with me no one will respect me that means you and i are still under the colonial impact it has not left us and that is why this subservience we have three phases there one is communal literature once the colonizer slept we had communal literature then we had post colonial literature now it is called new literatures do i have equality how am i represented so you know that is the next step how am i represented in western texts they speak for me how do they how do they represent me and the second one is rereading i'm not speaking from my own here i'm just echoing what is given in that wonderful book these three points right um beginning post colonialism by john mcleod so wonderful primer please read this when you approach these texts uh, uh, representations right representations of me in their texts in mrs dalavi you find an uh, you know expression called nincompoof that means a silly stupid indian girl the word nincompoof means a silly girl from india how dare without knowing what is india you write about india to talk about india as a stupid and the girls in india are stupid how dare you can say like that and this is what you know you find in uh, you know, these secular nation states especially by the displaced please remember the displaced have their own words the aborigines anita hayes you know 30th january 9 or uh, 2019 when she was here she said exactly the same how my voice was muted but i still started writing celebrating my voice i wanted to write my voice in my own terms i don't want anybody else to talk for me first they humiliate you but once you continue to write they will start celebrating you this is what she says she underwent humiliation when she writes this growing up aboriginal now i am just taking quickly two or three texts each from the australian and the canadian and uh, you know before we wind up quickly you know the aboriginal writers from australia for example jack davis you know one of the pioneering aboriginal poets who had this angst within him angst means please remember i'll give i'll give you three terms what you should look for when you study or read a, a text from you know these post colonial it could be india also it could be africa also africa and india is much higher but i'm saying you know canada and australia because you know it is part of your you know syllabus so you know when you look at an australian text like right, uh, a post colonial text how do you approach it three terms you can possibly you know look out for watch out for one is you the, you know the style i like, i would call it the style right? when you look at a text the first thing you see is the style of the text isn't it so the first one is the word indignant please make a note of that now whatever i'm saying you you will not find it in any google or whatever these are from books right? 
So indignant. Indignant means what? Rightful anger. When you see somebody hitting an old lady or hitting a girl, what will you feel? How dare he insult a girl or a, you know, uh, uh, an old lady? Immediately you will feel an anger. No, that is called righteous anger. And the only word for that in English is indignant. I n d i g n a n t. Indignant. The next word is poignant. P o i g n a. Just two, three words I'm giving you. You can look for in Australian, Canadian, post-colonial texts. You will find that indignation, righteous anger. How dare you come? Udguru Nunukal, Kate Walker. She is also called Kate Walker, the first Aboriginal poet. You know what she says? We are going. We are going. Poignant. Poignant means no sadness, regret, pain. We are going. We are means what? The natives. We are going. From where? Not from your land. From your own land. I'm leaving. We are going, right? The coro, you know, the, the, the corobora ring, right? Our uh, our local ways of you know shooting, fighting, the implements that we use, everything is lost. <coughs> the colonizers' ways, you no, know, their implements, their language is coming. Our Aboriginal languages are dying. We are going. We are displaced. Poignant. Indignant. Indignant means righteous anger. Jack Davis, when he saw a 16-year-old boy, Jack Pat, isn't it? You have that poem for you, Jack Pat. He was killed by the white police. He feels indignant, righteous anger. How can you kill an Aboriginal boy? In Tale of Two Cities, you have a scene where one of the royals from the Evermont family, you know, runs over a baby, a little kid playing in the street. His chariot runs over a baby. And what does he do? He just throws a coin. He just tosses a coin. Here, take it. No court, no justice. Nothing for the voiceless. No one to speak for them. He just throws a coin, flips a coin, take it. And that family is crying. Or only no kid or only son, little boy. No, he was toddling in the in the road, in the, in the corner of the road. He was run over by a chariot. Mercilessly he throws. The same way Jack Pat, an Aboriginal boy, is killed by you know the, the, the white police. How dare no? An Aboriginal boy is killed by a white settler who was coming. Then he writes. He has this pain. See, he's not a writer, basically. But he learned the language because he wanted to write down his pain. Please remember, any pain, unless Freud calls it, no, he, he says it's therapy. You know, a release of pain is called therapy. So he writes down his pain. For that, he learns his language. He writes down. So you don't have the pentameter here. Ringa, ringa, roses. You don't have a pentameter here. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. No. No rhyme schemes here. In post-colonial poetry, don't expect any rhyme scheme. It is atrocious or oxymoronic to expect any rhyme scheme here in post-colonial poetry because it celebrates pain. It has to be spontaneous. Like uh, Virginia Woolf says, no, in a stream of consciousness, it comes spontaneously. The pain, it cannot be put to music here. It has to be written down. The first thing that the whites tell him is tear off the pages. In Jack Davis's wonderful poem, you know, John Pat, tear off the pages. He's dead. Don't talk about the dead. He gets very angry. How can you say tear off the pages means don't write it down. Let it not become history. We don't want your history. We want selective history. We don't want your version of history. We have the victors. All history is the, you know, story of the victor, not the victim. Please remember that. All history that has been handed down to us till date is the story not of the victim or the silenced, but it's the story of the powerful. That's why it has been, you know, it has come down to us all these years. You are Fairy Queen by Spencer. 
because he glorified the queen he is still prescribed today post colonial studies is very critical mind you he glorified the queen he eulogized the queen he celebrated the queen although he wanted a different title for fairy queen he wanted the pageants but then he thought unless he is in the good books of the queen he cannot survive there were many other thousands of voices who wrote during the renaissance but who are not celebrated today why new historicism will tell you that because power and knowledge they go together so this you know particular writer he put down pen to paper when they say tear that page he's dead and gone but he says i won't do that i keep staring i don't know what to do i thought i should write it down my english is not that good but still i write it on because i want the future generations to know the pain that i witnessed right in front of my eyes when one of my own kindred was killed mercilessly by whom by the white police like what happened in america in the black lives matter campaign that was happening you know a couple of months back in america so you know this is the angst that you find in jack an aboriginal poet and another you know uh, Abor, uh, another poet from australia is called ad hope i'm just giving you because you know he talks about australia as a huge space as a barren space celebrating the land has nostalgic connections to the land there is another bush poet i'm quickly giving because there is lack of time there is another bush poet called banjo patterson please key into youtube and just listen to this song waltzing matilda when you have the time it's a ballad you it will tell you you can't understand i i swear you can't understand most of the terms that come in this wonderful little poem it's called almost called the unofficial national anthem of australia unofficial why you know when you see you know some of the videos there on youtube where they sing the song the whole audience will stand up and sing the song waltzing matilda the tune is very popular today most of us would have known the tune very popular banjo patterson sir you know uh, bush ballad it's called a bush ballad celebrates the bush way of life in the vast australian outback les murray calls it the sprawl in one of the poems that you read this you know bush poem talks about a uh, uh, you know a guy who just has a backpack on him and uh, he has a billy boy with him billy and then he goes on his way like a vagabond he just shoots something that comes his way no, none of the terms you'll understand it so, now this celebration of the local judith right also does that uh in one in one of her celebrations of poem cycads right it's a it's a native species of a plant that is native only to australia and she talks about that celebrates that in the poem what is special about the cycads it lives for thousands of years not like the annual the biannual the seasonal the perennial the endural plants that we have it lives for thousands of years and she doesn't celebrate a daffodil that she doesn't know she doesn't celebrate you know any other plant or tree that she doesn't know she celebrates a tree or a plant that is native to her own place where she lives judith right and why is it special because she says you know this plant that i celebrate it is like a palm tree right i'm just showing you this because you know it will it, it, help you understand better it is like a palm tree a beautiful palm tree and it lives for thousands of years nobody else in the world would have seen this right cycads except me judith right says and why is it special because we you know she is an environmentalist also right we connect with the land the three l they call it land language and right uh, literature right land language and literature, they have a connect this interconnectedness with the land with the bush creatures 
with uh, the emu, the kangaroo, you know, a, a whole lot of these native species. This interconnectedness you find in Judith Wright, a celebration of the land, the vast outback, although like A.D. Hope says, you know, the five cities are like five teeming source you know, and uh, the rivers are a whole lot of negative terms, he says, but then he says, I celebrate my land. Towards the end, he says, I celebrate my land. This celebration of the land, you will find, although you find in Australian mainstream literature, also in the native Aboriginal literature, you find that in abundance. Les Murray, another writer. He's called the voice of Australia. Like uh, Whitman is called the poet of America. Les Murray is another poet from Australia who talks about this interconnectedness. He was a rebel in many ways. But again, this pain when somebody else displaces me and how I give back. Bill Ashcroft has written a book. It is titled Writing Back, Empire Writes Back. How do I give back? I have a lot of strategies. The one strategy that I told you, they don't write in pentameters. It comes spontaneously to them. And there is another writer called Annie of Walswich. She's an immigrant to Australia and she doesn't write in chaste English. She doesn't know her English. She writes English right, in her own way. We call it broken English. Like George Bernard Shaw right, has, has written an, uh, an essay called Spoken English, Broken English. It is a kind of a broken English, but she says, I will have to write my pain in English. Why? Only then the world will know. Most of the world has been colonized by English. English is now the international language. So I should write in English. So you will find in Anya's poems, it's almost, you know, you will feel bad also sometimes. Why is she writing like this? The English there. A celebration of her own idiom. Why? Because post-colonial nation states believe with Kamala Das in the wonderful poem introduction, she says, no, the language that I speak becomes mine. You don't have to say that this is how I have to write. You don't have to say that this is how I have to speak. I speak the way I like. I write the way I write, I, I like. You don't have to tell me how to write. I write my pain. When I shout with pain, I will not say, oh, mother. I won't say like that. I'll say, Amma. When somebody hits me, I won't say, oh, my dad. I won't say that. I'll say, Appa. That is the spontaneous language that comes from me when I'm hurt. So how dare you ask me to write, oh, mother, oh, father. In your language, in your pentameter, when I have a pain in me. And that is why when you approach, I'm just giving you approaches on how to analyze poems or texts with the history of colonialism. Texts that have been written by post-colonial writers. How to look at them. Please look at the language. Is it indignant? First word. Righteous anger. The second one. Uh, the third one, right? I, I said indignant. And the second one also I said, the third one is observant. Observant means I look at the intricacies. Poignant is different. Poignant means, you know, a regret, a, 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 a longing for the lost past, like Catherine, um, you know, Kate Walker says, no, we are going. Indignant, rightful anger. Poignant is different. But observant means I observe how I'm being victimized. I have an observant eye. A good poet should have always an observant eye. What is going on around the third? Make a note of it. If you are a poet, if you are a writer, if you are a diarist, you have a great future. Not today. 20 years from now, you might be celebrated. Today, you might not know your worth. You might not know the aura that surrounds you because you know once you live today, it is gone. But when you preserve today for posterity, after 25 years when you look back, it becomes a relic of the past. 
that is why you know you should write down whatever thought comes to you don't think that you should write in the westerners you know chaste english write in your own terms the way it comes to you and when you you know read these texts with the history of colonialism please see whether the style is indignant or poignant poignant means i told you know that sense of loss or regret we are going a poignant a moving story it makes you cry you know the way she says it in aborigine poet the first aborigine poet from australia the third one is observant how refugee mother and child by you will see that intricate details that he gives observant minute details that he gives why in order to you know propel or accentuate the intensity of the pain you have to be observant every detail of the incident should be noted down only then tomorrow's generation right can look back look back and look at the atrocities that have happened right to your own people and unless you archive them unless you write them down no one is going to celebrate you and you know uh, i'll quickly go into the canadian landscape because we don't have you know, time in the canadian landscape you have a lot of first nations writers right thomas king is there right they write with this sense of angst again how the whites came settled there and then dehumanized them not only margaret atwood she is a mainstream writer but she has a sympathies for the first nations the metis how you know these native writers they have a mentality that atwood would call the garrison mentality a fortified mentality how the natives you know they always have please remember they are called dominion settler nations settler nations i told you still even today the queen if you log into any authentic source on the web you'll find the queen is still the you know honorary head of these settler nations queen elizabeth the second you'll find the name there so you know they celebrate what is called the queen most of the universities there also you'll find you know queensland university or you know you know most of these places in canada or australia or new zealand or south africa you'll find these you know uh, occidental names there because of this impact <coughs> excuse me right canadian authors meet by a first cut where is that rises you know the slavish mentality of the natives for the west i'll just give you one poem i'll just read you uh, three lines from the poem i have with me and then i'll wind up it's uh, it's uh, it's it's by am clean right it's called indian reservation conawaga i'll just read you you know one line just one line where are the braves the faces like autumn fruit look at that where are the braves this is how it opens you have it prescribed am clean sir uh, indian reservation conawaga <clears throat> where are the braves the first nations are supposed to be braves i'll just give you an example you have a beautiful river in your area in your area a wonderful river behind you your ancestors your forefathers have been celebrating that river for centuries and centuries so there were beautiful boats there were beautiful ships in that river now what the white man does is i'm just hypothesizing right what the white man does it they come here they completely do away with the river they completely destroy the river right and what they do is so once the river is destroyed no use of a boat no use of a ship right and what they do is after that they sell what is called relics of the river how there no it's like you know selling a you know it's a boat and they tell you these are relics of the natives and they sell like hot cakes this is how they capitalize on the natives in the first nations how dare you destroy all my culture my you know way of living and then 
you start selling you know that's what you know in the last line there in this poem because it's prescribed for you i'm just saying you know they are there in a museum right they are there in a museum kept what is kept in the museum the relics right like this and uh, you know uh, when i went to the andamans a couple of years back we all know the jarawa tribes are there uh, you know sentinelis uh, many other tribes are there we were surprised to find some of the things that uh, you know these tribes use are sold by them you know by the locals on oh, yes, uh, yeah sold by them i was surprised excuse me i was surprised i was asking where are they no they are almost extinct and gone you can't find them and now they have become relics of the past and this is something that canadian native literature first nations literature tries to exhibit the pain of displacement how displacement has impacted me ways of seeing how do i see my own friend my own brother my own kith and kin do i have a craze for what is called the neo colonization the drinks that the white man has brought in new forms of imperialism do i appreciate the white person as intelligent more intelligent or you know when i go for uh, uh, what is called uh, a matrimonial alliance i do i say i need a fair and handsome guy fair and beautiful girl fair if you are still saying like that that means you and i are still under the post colonial no other uh, sorry under the colonial hangover after many many years this year fair and lovely hindustan lever has decided to cut off the fair from lovely they say every color is lovely you know why that is because of the criticism that comes from our classrooms foucault michel foucault i would like to conclude right with michel foucault michel foucault is one of the important theorists of the 20th century he was he was instrumental in post colonial studies said spivak and you know homi baba and a whole lot of others were influenced and inspired by michel foucault derrida and others right so michel foucault says knowledge is given to the world by just two in two forms right knowledge is given to the world in just two forms excuse me one is in the classrooms and the other is through the medical field how is knowledge emanated or disseminated how does knowledge reach society every person who is a collector an ias officer today or a minister or a president or the you know a, a respectable person in society they were all once in a classroom their teachers taught them something you and i were taught something this way the way we have been taught helps us to see the world and that's why foucault says you know knowledge is always connected with power power and knowledge they are always connected he says two ways in which knowledge is disseminated one is through what is called the educational field in the classrooms our teacher says uh oh, yeah. india got its independence in the year and immediately we say yes we buy hard it america got its independence in the year immediately we buy hard it australia got its we buy hard it so this knowledge and the second one is medical field they write a particular disease and say this is covid covid you can't say it is covid only a medical doctor has to certify it is covid and it becomes widespread throughout the world every tom dick and harry will say covid who said that the medical field quarantine medical doctors say you'll have to be in quarantine for 14 days even the collector the is officers have to ask the medical doctor for expert guidance they disseminate knowledge foucault says the knowledge that we gain right in our classrooms should be able to transform society 
I should be able to respect the other. The other means it could be the opposite sex, it could be the transgenders, it could be you know uh, uh, the marginalized, it could be the aborigines, it could be women or it could be men or it could be children. Anyone who is the other, anyone who is silenced, anyone who is stigmatized, anyone who is stereotyped, our knowledge that we gain should help us remove this ignorance, this dark cloud of ignorance from me and help me reach out to the other. I will never look down upon a person just because she is dark. I will never look down upon a person just because she does not speak good English. She has a whole lot of talents within her. How dare I put her down because she doesn't speak a good English? Just because she is a bit wheatish in color, how dare I put her down? When we have this enlightened view to society, we can look at post-colonial texts from that viewpoint, the indignant, the poignant, and the observant. When we can celebrate the other, when we can respect the other, as you know, Evelyn Hill says, I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend till my death your right to say it. I love this expression a lot. When we celebrate the other, post-colonial studies that we practice in the classroom will become a reality in social practice also. Knowledge in classroom connects with societal practice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was, uh, I don't know how else to say this, but uh, a, a fabulous mesmerizing lecture. What a mind blowing lecture and end to the, to the three day uh, lecture series. Um, we have received a lot of positive uh, comments and uh, there are a few questions also. Um, it was literally a, a, a sumptuous uh, literary feast to our ears. Um, shall we move on to a, to a short Q&A session, sir? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, thank you. So the, the first question, uh, which was posted much earlier in the chat stream, uh, so I'm not uh, uh, making it appear on the screen right now. I'll just verbally tell it to you. Uh, the, the, how, in what ways do you think the colonizers uh, have still have an influence over the colonized? In what ways do you think? Yes. Good, very good question. A very wonderful question, right? The, the legacy that they have left us is in the, mostly in the realm of language. So that is, uh, it's a legacy, right, kind of, you know, and language, please remember the three terms, as I told you, L, I, C, it will be easy for you to remember if I say it that way, right, language, identity, culture, because they have left us this legacy, the Japanese, they don't have this legacy, the impact of the colonizer is still there, and second, you know, apart from language, it, they have taught us certain ways of seeing, ways of seeing in the sense, I looked on Shyam Selwyn is the best example. In 1979, he gave a lecture. Right? Three into one can't go. In that lecture, he says how he was asked or how he was colonized into looking down upon his own person, upon his own friend who was the black. Right. So this is the legacy they have, that they have left us. Uh, like, you know, in the form of language and language, when it becomes internalized, we look down upon a it teaches us certain ways of seeing, right? What teaches us? Language teaches us certain ways of seeing. And so, you know, these, this is the impact, right? The influence we, we still feel even today. But how can I overcome that? That could be a possible question that follows. I would say when we are proud of our own color, I may be dark, you know, like uh, Kamala Das says in the 1960s, that I forgot the exact year. I am dark brown. I am from Malabar. I speak two languages. So, you know, that pride, I am brown. I celebrate that. This celebration mode, that is when you can boldly say you have come out of that mentality.
thank you sir so the next question i will just make it appear on your screen sir you will uh, you can see it so you can read it you can read it out for me okay how can we this is by uh, miss anuradha how can we decolonize our cognitive levels even within the nation at various levels like gender caste class etc good good how can we decolonize at the cognitive level a very good question a sensible question right at the national level at gender caste no you can't change the world you can't change the society around you uh, it is like the story where a person went out to change the world right 10 years he tried he couldn't do it and then he said i'll change my nation then 10 years he wasted he couldn't do it then he said i'll change my state 10 years wasted he couldn't do it then my own city 10 years wasted 40 years of his life wasted already he was 20 now he's 60 years wasted then he said my own sit my own you know locality another 10 years wasted so where does it begin it begins with me when i see a violation that happens in my own backyard if i can give a voice for that if i can talk about that if i see a pain in my society a woman is being victimized in facebook or in instagram someone is you know harassing her on facebook i give a voice not only that i celebrate myself what whitman in song of you know songs of myself he says i sing my barbaric york it is barbaric but still it is my voice i am proud of it the moment i celebrate my color my identity my individuality there it begins yes i undergo a lot of problems but i don't want to hide it as a woman i undergo a lot of problems i i i, I underwent you know uh, someone misbehaved with me but i'm not going to suppress it as a transgender i underwent some problems as a man as a child i underwent some problems but the the moment i voice it i'm giving voice right that is what you know is the need of the hour i should celebrate myself how in my writing in my poems in the way i respond it is not reacting it is responding to a problem in society you can read you know sudhamurthy's texts you know, little stories come straight from the heart right it will help us engage better with you know the you know practical feminism good question sir thank you so the next question is by uh, ms ashwini uh, how could you elaborate on how knowledge and power operates in the context of the aborigines and the first nations oh good very good yes yeah see um, the the question is about representation where there is power there is knowledge so the aborigines were left out of power so their knowledge did not come to the fore in australia only after the 1960s is they passed the 1960s they passed the aboriginal act when they were given some rights and once they started speaking for themselves you know after a particular point of time they started coming to the front and after that you know their knowledge began to come up why because the powers recognized them unless the powers recognize these knowledges yesterday in a reading group I was sharing a, a wonderful phrase, an insurrection of subjugated knowledges. What are these subjugated knowledges? Maybe the place where I stay today. Hundreds of years back, there were you know natives who belonged to this place. They had their own knowledge systems, indigenous knowledge systems we call them. You know, they they have a rich legacy. How many of us know this indigenous knowledge system? They can predict, you know. Uh, it is called the plant time you know what the um, in psychics uh, psychics judith right celebrates plant time animal time what we celebrate is clock time but they have a different time type of time so when we give an insurrection of these suppressed knowledges new ways of looking at the world will emerge and so you know uh, in first nations also 
a whole lot of writers have come up only of late, right, uh, uh, who are writing on the First Nations, right, and uh, Aborigines in Australia. Anita Heiss also talks about that growing up Aboriginal, why she was, uh, how she was, uh, you know, considered a second hand citizen because she was an Aborigine. If you read A.D. Hope's poem Australia, there he says, you know, uses a demeaning expression. Australia is a land where second-hand Europeans pollulate, right? Second-hand Europeans. So, you know, once they are given their voice, like in her uh, essay, now can the subaltern speak? When the subaltern speaks, you no, know, they are given their voice, they can speak for themselves. No one needs to represent them. I hope I have answered. Thank you, sir. Uh, this may come as a follow-up to the previous question uh, uh, by Ms. Priscilla. Do you think history and power can be changed through resistance? Mm, good question. Through resistance, through, uh, you know, what are the modes of resistance that you can use as an individual? Because history and power have always been on the side of the dominant. There are, you know, three modes of discourse. You know, residual, dominant and you know emergent discourses we call it so dominant discourses they have connected the history they say this has happened you know you believe it i believe it it has happened but you know you can't necessarily change the course of history <clears throat> what has happened in the past through resistance but you can change the course of the present and create a history through resistance Maybe in 1963, tomorrow, exactly, 28th August, 1963, when, uh, you know, lakhs and lakhs of blacks, they marched toward, they marched towards Washington, D.C. Why? Fighting for their rights. And that particular day created history because they knew that they cannot change history. And Derek Walcott says, no, I met history, but history did not recognize me. So I cannot change history now. It has already been written down. The, an interesting text you will, you will like to read is uh, Archival Fever by Derrida. He says, you know, history is always filled with violence. He uses the word archives. History is always filled with violence. So you can't change history, but you can change the present through how you react or respond and create history for the better for tomorrow. Martin Luther's speech that day, you know, even today, when we listen that listen to that speech on YouTube or AmericanRhetoric.com, it will bring tears to your eyes, isn't it? Right? I have a dream that one day my four little black children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day my four little black children will walk hand in hand with the white children. So I can create history by my writing, by my fighting by my talks, but, but by how I respond in my own terms of resistance. A very good question. Very wonderful question. Thank you. And a wonderful answer, if I may say so, sir. Uh, could you shed light on the next question by uh, Rama Sudhakar? Can you please explain the, the association of the genre of magical realism with colonialism? and the dissociation from the oppressive institution that followed. Good, good, very good. Yeah. Magical realism is a subgenre of first colonial studies. The reason is, you know, magical realism differs, I'll just give you a simple little, you know, working definition of magical realism. <clears throat> I'm not going into Ferdinand Ortiz, you know, a whole lot of these scholars who dabbled on magical, you know, not that. I'll put it very simply. When the real and the magical weave together in a harmonious soul without you knowing about it, that is magical realism. This charm is there in our host of post-colonial texts, be it Salman Rushdie or Gabriel Garcia Marquis or you know Anita Nair or a whole lot of these post -colonial. Why? Because this is uh, this is the aura. You know, you have it in the title of our, of our uh, topic also today. Aura means something you know unique to us. Where the magical or the you know uh, the fanciful merges together with the real. To put it very simply, I'll just give you an example. 
I want to switch on this fan. What do I do? I just go to the wall, switch on, turn on the switch. That is realism. But what is magical realism when I just do like this and the fan right, starts working? That is magical realism. And why this magical realism is popular in postcolonial texts? Because, you know, it, it is it is called a sub, sub genre of you know postcolonial text because you know we had this mystical charm you know you know we celebrate that if you look at the you know aboriginal texts you know because I personally dealt with a lot of aboriginal texts when I was working on my PhD now I'm doing my second PhD also on you know so uh, you know in aboriginal texts you will find the magical and the real they interweave. It's, it's like a perfect harmony. There is a sync between them. And that is why you have you know, a plethora of these magical realistic elements in post-colonial text. And we love it also. I'll just give you a, a crude example. When we see a hero right, on screen, any hero, I don't want to name a hero. right? He'll be a very ordinary person. But when he comes on screen, we have an awe for him. Right? We have a kind of a aura for him. He'll be a very ordinary person. But he'll just raise his hands like this. Right? And then he will do like this. And he will, you know, uh, clench his fist like this. The moment he clenches his fist, you will see a whole lot of nerves going in. There will be a lot of sound also. Clack, 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 something like that. The sound goes in. And even when he clenches the fist, how many times I clench, no music will be heard. But there will be a lot of music when he clenches his fist. And then hundreds of opponents, enemies will be there, gundas, all thugs with a huge built body. You know, they'll be there in front of him. He will just give one punch to one person and there will be a sound also, you know, a kind of echo. Whoa, whoa. They'll all fall, you know, in a hundred different places. Again, that is magical realism. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll uh, take one final question, sir. And this is in two parts. Uh, do you think that we should be aware of our colonization uh, to break away from it, especially since we unknowingly sometimes follow colonial ways? And what could be the positive takeaway from that? Very brilliant question. Thank you. Right. The positive takeaways are there, although there are negative effects also, harmful effects. Right. Like uh, that's why post-colonial studies was born. Please remember that 1952 book that, uh, you know, um, uh, who's that? Uh, the Wretched of the Earth, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, Franz Fanon wrote, right? I forgot his name, Franz Fanon. That he was the pioneer of post-colonial studies. When he felt hurt, when he was going on the metro, when he was called a devil because he was black in a white compartment, that is when post-colonial studies is born. So there are negative effects also. You know, people look down upon me, but the positive effects, like Chinu HB says, it has given me a tongue, right? A tongue with which that I can instantly connect. I read, you know, a lot of English literature, American literature, but I don't do Chinese literature because I have to depend on translations. Mo Yang, that, uh, you know, that Nobel laureate, one of the first Nobel laureates from China. We have to depend only on translations. Tokar you know, last year she won the Nobel Prize from Turkey. We have to depend on translations. But these writers, we can directly access them from England or from America or, you know, all these places, South Africa, you know, New Zealand, Australia, because we have access to the language. You know, Tiongo says, I'm going to reject English. I'll start writing in my mother tongue because the language doesn't rep represent my culture. But Chinu Achibi would be a reply to the wonderful question that you raised. Chinu Achibi says, I will take the language that he has left behind, but I will use it to write back to the colonizer using a whole lot of native terms. Now, yesterday in a group, I was using structural nativization, glossing, a whole lot of native terms I will use as writing back to the center. This is one way that we can counter the impact of colonization on us. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for all your wonderful answers and uh, uh, now I would like to hand over the forum to our HOD, uh, Dr. Rama, for her kind comments. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Walter. Uh, 
like you said uh, i mean i am dumbstruck because i want to use the words of dr rufus uh, he said he is going to serve us a dish and i want to tell you sir your the cuisine that you served us is a great feast and a treat to us and again using your words you influenced us you inspired us and you impacted us so what an expressive presentation it was very descriptive demonstrative and in all mind blowing thank you so much sir and you voiced our grievances we especially who feel that our culture has been destroyed so i think we need these writings in pain of the aboriginal writers who teach uh, in fact sorry who trash uh, the colonial hangover and create awareness about our identity i've used many of the phrases that you use sir and this is testimony to the way that you have in fact impacted all of us today i would like to thank specifically dr bennett for introducing dr rufus to us and i would like to commend my colleague nadia for arranging such excellent resource person so i would at this juncture place on record my uh, heartfelt thanks to all the resource person of the three days and my special thanks to dr rufus for accept accepting our invitation and enlightening us today thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you ma'am uh, with that we will move on to the to the final uh, formal vote of thanks uh, i kindly request my colleague ms m nadia assistant professor department of english and other foreign languages to deliver the vote of thanks over to you ma'am thank you sir the root of joy is gratefulness on behalf of srm institute of science and technology and the nt fraternity it gives me immense pleasure to propose vote of thanks to our eminent chief guest dr s samuel rufus who honored this program as resource person and has rendered a glimpse of abundant knowledge which is extremely relevant on post colonial era in the australian and canadian literary milieu and you write it and deliberate the colonization with lot of examples from literature sir thank you sir i remain grateful to our director dean snh vp academic and vp admin for their motivation and support i am delightful to thank our hod dr v rama professor and head department of english and other foreign languages srm institute of science and technology for her guidance in all the endeavors and i would especially thank my colleagues in the department for their unfaltering support and my deep sense of appreciation and thanks to all the participants who chose to be with us and attended the webinar with great enthusiasm and made it a successful event last but surely not the least i thank dr walter and ms preeta assistant professors department of english and other foreign languages srm institute of science and technology for all the technical support and for guidance once again i thank you all for being with us this morning and have a wonderful day ahead thank you thank you so much uh, nadia ma'am uh, with that we come to the end of a uh, a uh, very very enlightening uh, lecture three day lecture series thank you so much uh, rufus sir. i think all so the three you, of sir. them made uh, i think all the three of you made our entire online lecture series so memorable uh, that uh, i think uh, though we teach uh, technical english uh, we now have our own uh, doubts whether we should switch over to teaching literature so i think yes. i should thank you i thank you all immensely sir thank you so much in the words of a colleague i should steal these words from one of my colleagues who said years what you have presented is years of research uh, uh, delivered in a in a most awesome deliberation today thank you so much sir thank you thank you so much just a nice time with you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you Yes, sir. You can uh, go time? ahead and leave the studio, sir. Oh. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. You can leave. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.
Okay, ma'am. We can leave the studio. Yes. Yeah, you are saying only negative stuff. I don't think 